Flushing on the Siegfried Line. Now in the massive new offensive, Operation Veritable, troops of the 1st Canadian Army are ruthlessly winkling out the enemy from the ruins of the old medieval town of Cleve. It's all part of the plan to destroy Hitler's armies west of the Rhine and send Allied columns streaking into the heart of the Reich. The men who direct this operation, Field Marshal Montgomery and General Crerer of the 1st Canadian Army, are making a valiant bid to force that western door to Berlin. But the battle was not going according to plan. It had been intended that Operation Veritable, with General Horrocks British 30 Corps temporarily under Canadian command, would break through the so-called Siegfried Line, then make a spirited 40-kilometer dash to the Rhine opposite Wesel. The operation was to have been part of a pincer move, but the start of the US 9th Army's Operation Grenade had been delayed by denial operations, which flooded the Ruhr Valley and allowed the Germans to concentrate the bulk of their best units against Operation Veritable. For the Allies, a combination of foul weather, appalling ground conditions, and several doubtful tactical decisions caused delays and paralyzing traffic congestion, which virtually halted the main thrust for the whole of the third day. Vital routes bypassing Cleve over this high ground had not been totally secured, and the Germans, though surprised at first, were now reinforcing rapidly. Allied problems were compounded by rising floods, caused by continued German dike blowing operations, and by day three the main core axis was under four feet of water in places. Amphibious vehicles and rafts became indispensable for the supply of the spearhead units. Ducks, weasels, buffaloes. A whole menagerie of special-to-task amphibious vehicles made warfare possible in conditions which would have halted earlier armies. The surprise and momentum of Operation Veritable had been lost, and what lay ahead would bear no resemblance to the original plan. The shambles in and around Cleve was not resolved until the end of the fourth day, when, if everything had gone according to plan, the operation should have been over. But the delay and confusion had given General Alfred Schlem, commanding the German 1st Parachute Army, valuable time. The Armoured Reserve, the 47th Panzer Corps, had been placed under his command at the end of the third day. Now in the fourth night, as the 43rd Wessex Division's 214 Brigade finally opened up the bypass route around Cleve, the 47th Panzer Corps prepared to counterattack. General von Lutwitz's orders were to recapture Cleve, but the leading battalions of the 43rd Wessex Division were consolidating here, and the 53rd Welsh Division was threatening to cut the Cleve Goch Road. So he decided to attack into the Reichswald instead, where the Allies would find it more difficult to exploit their vastly superior resources, then to recapture the all important Matterborn feature. The 47th Panzer Corps comprised two of the Wehrmacht's best divisions, the 116th Panzer and the 15th Panzer Grenadier. But they had been severely weakened by the Ardennes action, which had left them with only about 30 tanks, and there were many recent infantry replacements. But the artillery was in good shape, and the headquarters staff immensely experienced. The German counterattacks began at 0900 hours and continued throughout day five, but without success. Indeed, leading units of the 43rd Wessex and 15th Scottish divisions made further progress. So at nightfall, von Lutwitz disengaged and prepared to defend a line following a low ridge feature here. 
In the meantime, the 51st Highland Division had captured Gennep, but more importantly, Heckens, which enabled this road to be used to ease the critical supply situation caused by the floods, through which the 3rd Canadian Division continued to make steady progress with its amphibious operations. As the division advanced, so a line of smoke generators along the Rhine was extended to screen Allied activities from the enemy on the far bank. Eventually, the smoke screen stretched almost continuously for over 27 kilometers. But now, for the first time, five days after the start of Operation Veritable, sufficient German formations had arrived to stabilize the front. Facing 30 Corps' five divisions were two German corps, the 47th Panzer and the 86th Infantry. Deployed along the front were the 7th Parachute Division, the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, the 116th Panzer Division, and what little remained of the 84th Infantry Division, reinforced by units of the 6th and 7th Parachute and 346th Infantry Divisions. Further units were fed in piecemeal as and when they arrived. On the Allied side, the initiative remained with the 43rd Wessex Division, which planned to capture the escarpment at Goch by leapfrogging its brigades from one low ridge feature to the next and bypassing this enemy-held wood, which would be subject to intense bombardment from rocket batteries and from the air. At 10 hundred hours on day six, the lead battalion of the division's 129th Brigade attacked the first ridge feature, the Eselsberg, right in the center of the new enemy defensive position, which the Germans had now had some 17 hours to prepare. They had deployed their limited resources intelligently and effectively, and from now on the fighting would take on a very different and bitter character. As the lead battalion attacked, it suffered heavy casualties from intense artillery and mortar fire. But it pressed on and gained the ridge. But the following battalion, though it captured the next low hill, failed to capture the brigade objective, the crossroads here. Tanks fired directly at the troops from the cover of the woodland edge. The Germans had also made good use of the farms, which were ideally sited to provide excellent, mutually supporting defensive positions. Low trip wires covered the approaches and would detonate flares or anti-personnel mines. Anti-tank guns would be carefully concealed among the buildings, hedges and small orchards. Troops would shelter from Allied shelling in the robust farmhouse cellars. Then, when it stopped, quickly man fire positions in the buildings or in slits round the perimeters. And when the British troops captured a position, they faced immediate counterattacks designed to prevent them consolidating. Both sides fought round the clock, hard and well. The 43rd Wessex could only inch forward painfully slowly. The land mattresses pounded the flanking woodland and on day seven the weather cleared temporarily to permit close support air operations, taking as little as seven minutes from the time they were tasked by the forward air controllers Typhoons peeled off from their aerial cab ranks to make rocket attacks on targets as close as 300 yards in front of the leading troops. But the resolve of the German troops remained firm. Heavy enfilading fire poured into the 43rd Division's flank and vicious counter-attacks were launched by a freshly arrived battle group of veteran paratroopers prepared to fight to the last. 
It took three and a half days of continuous and costly fighting to advance just two kilometers. And while this desperate battle was being so bitterly contested, back in Cleve, only six kilometers behind the front, the 43rd Division's Reserve Brigade was also hard at work, training for the eventual attack on Goch. But what had been happening elsewhere on the front? In the four relatively quiet months preceding Operation Veritable, the Reichswald had been the one prominent, forbidding, almost sinister feature dominating the landscape, and clearly a formidable obstacle if defended resolutely. Very little could be learned of the Siegfried Line defences in the forest, and fueled by German propaganda, they were greatly overrated. For in the event, they turned out to be a double line of trenches, a series of bunkers, and virtually unmanned. The Allies' opening artillery bombardment so overwhelmed the Germans in their forward defences that few remained with either the will or the organisation to fall back to defend the Siegfried position. The advance was slowed far more by the bad weather and ground conditions, which necessitated a 48-hour pause while engineers, pioneers and anyone else who could be spared, including fighting troops of reserve brigades, struggled to improve the routes so that essential supplies could be moved forward and casualties evacuated. In such conditions, there were few vehicles capable of moving at all. Nevertheless, on day four, when the advance was resumed, it made some eight kilometers in the face of stiffening opposition, and two days later, the forest had been cleared. Fighting in the forest required special planning and tactics to overcome problems of navigation by day and night and of units losing touch with one another. There was always a danger from parties of the enemy, which could all too easily be missed and from self-propelled guns with good fields of fire down the forest rides and from silent enemy infiltration. Many weapons pits had been dug throughout the forest, but fortunately most had been abandoned and many unused panzerfausts left behind. Artillery support was seldom used. The danger from tree bursting shells was too great. Similarly, tanks could rarely fire HE, but their presence was reassuring, and their machine guns often helped to disperse the few pockets of enemy resistance that were encountered. Once the edge of the Reichswald was reached, patrols probed the country beyond. This was always nerve-wracking work, but could sometimes bring surprising rewards. The company commander heard some noise uh, coming from a house uh, standing in open country. He ordered this sergeant uh, to take a patrol uh, to investigate. And when they were within 30 or 40 yards of the house, a German sentry appeared to be rudely and quietly dealt with by the patrol. The sergeant then decided uh, to attack the farmhouse threw grenades through the windows, and entering the house, fired repeatedly down the staircase into the cellar. After a certain amount of shouting and obvious panic below, 30 fully armed German parachutists emerged with their hands up. When it was explained to them that they had been dealt with by a total of three men, they thought that the sergeant and the others had been very unfair indeed. In the meantime, the 3rd Canadian Division had completed clearing pockets of the enemy from the flooded areas, and General Creerer had reorganized the battle zone into two separate corps sectors. The 2nd Canadian Division had rejoined the battle, and together with the 3rd Canadian Division would fight towards Kalkar and Vesel. 
while the British 30th Corps, now reinforced by the 52nd Lowland Division, would continue to push to Goch and Geldern. For the 2nd Canadian Corps, the stiffest resistance was met here, in the long, narrow, pine-covered ridge of Moyland Woods, which, in sharp contrast to the Reichswald, the Germans were determined to defend at all costs, since they dominated the routes to Kalkar, identified by the enemy commanders as the main axis of the Allied advance. Intense, well-directed artillery, mortar and machine gun fire destroyed repeated Canadian attacks, and the battle for the woods raged on for a bitter, bloody and costly eight days. There seemed little hope of rapid progress anywhere, until on the afternoon of day nine, the pressure of the highly trained 43rd Wessex Division's attack maintained throughout nearly four days of continuous, fierce fighting proved too much. A fresh brigade, attacking on a two-battalion front, broke through the enemy. A third battalion in Kangaroos drove deeper through the German positions at nightfall to cut the goch Kalkar road. And a fourth battalion made a silent night attack towards the escarpment dominating Goch. In about 12 hours, the 43rd Wessex had punched a hole through the enemy some four and a half kilometers deep. But rather than trying to exploit this route and bypass Goch, it was decided to attack the town itself. The escarpment was captured on day 10. During the night, the outer anti-tank ditch was bridged. The following day, a set-piece assault with special armour struggled over these waterlogged meadows to cross a second anti-tank ditch. It took all day. What it good? Once into the town, there followed three days of tedious and hard-fought street fighting allowing the Germans ample time once again to stabilize the front. Allied troops were particularly wary of the enemy fighting from cellars, a traditional feature of German architecture, but of such solid construction with their street-level windows giving good, mutually supporting fields of fire that the Allies believed they had been specially designed for war. In fact, they were vulnerable to grenade and flame attack, and there was usually only one way out, so that after offering initial resistance, the defenders seldom remained to oppose the assaults mounted to overcome them. But for both sides, cellars made useful headquarters and proved welcome protection from artillery and aerial bombardments. The town was finally cleared on day 14. The same day, a carefully coordinated attack with a special artillery fire plan, wasp flamethrowers and close air support overcame resistance at last in Moyland Woods. But the 2nd Canadian Division was halted here, having suffered some temporary reverses at the hands of the 116th Panzer Division and the newly arrived Panzer Lehr Division, the last and strongest of the enemy reserves in the West. All along the front, Schlem's 1st Parachute Army held firm. Here, the 52nd Lowland Division had been halted for four days, mainly by SP guns operating from behind two anti-tank ditches and well-directed from this medieval fortress, Schloss Bleisenbeck. Repeated Allied infantry attacks proved costly failures, and the fortress was only captured after rocket-firing typhoons and nine 1,000-pound bombs had all but demolished it. Yet the 52nd Lowland Division's advance remained halted for a further seven days. Operation Veritable planned to reach Wesel in four days, but it was now two weeks old and not yet halfway there. But the front had broadened, and the Allies still had fresh divisions in reserve, whereas Schlem had none. The floods everywhere were now falling, and it could not be long before the US 9th Army was able to launch the long-delayed Operation Grenade against the German 15th Army, 
now severely weakened by the removal of many units to oppose Operation Veritable. Inevitably, the sheer weight of the overwhelmingly superior Allied resources would compel Schlem's army to withdraw across the Rhine. The question was, how long would it take? And at what cost? 